Without further ado, I request Mr. Sashi Kumar, the founder and chairman of the Media Development Foundation, to begin the proceedings with a welcome note. Kindly do make your way to the stage. Thank you, Ayush. That was Ayush, a student of our college who uh, did the honors in the beginning. And let me add my note of welcome to his. Um, as we uh, prepare to celebrate Pongal in Tamil Nadu, uh, we are also chastened by the reality of what is happening in our neighborhood in West Asia, uh, where a war has taken a heavy toll of uh, civilian, civilian life, 70% uh, of them, by all estimates, being women and children. Uh, all of you, of course, particularly students who are a good part of this audience of journalism, are aware of the details of what has been happening since October 7th, when uh, a dastardly and certainly uh, horrific attack by Hamas on Israel took place and the retaliation has been uh, unconscionably, I think, uh, indefensibly, multifold, disproportionate. And uh, as we speak now, uh, hearings have just concluded in international court in UN at The Hague, where South Africa had brought up the issue of a genocide perhaps taking place in, in Gaza and asking for provisional measures to halt the the killings without, and of course, the merits of whether it's a genocide or not will be judged later. And both the uh, uh, South African legal experts and the Israeli legal experts have in subsequent days presented their case. So that's where we're at. Um, today we have a, a galaxy, if I might call it that, of speakers, uh, experts who have looked at this issue, not just in the context of what's happening now, but looked at West Asia, looked at the Arab-Israel issue, uh, and um, we are very happy that they are joining us. This is a hybrid event. We have uh, uh, many of our experts joining us here today physically, and some of them joining us online from abro abroad. And therefore, we uh, are also keeping our fingers crossed that the connectivity with the online component will happen seamlessly so that we are not uh, there are no hiccups or jarring notes as we proceed. Uh, my task in this session is really to welcome all of you, particularly our uh, expert speakers who have come from uh, Chennai and different parts of the country, uh, and uh, guests who have come here to join us on this uh, day, and of course, the students and faculty uh, and uh, uh, others from from ACJ itself. Uh, um, I was uh, struck when I was I happened to be reading the works of Gandhi in another context recently, and I was struck that uh, as far back as 1938, in fact, on the 26th of November 1938, in the Harijan, Gandhiji speaks about uh, uh, the Arabs. The, the Arab Israel or the Palestine Israel issue. Uh, and I quote him. Uh, this is uh, on the 26th of November in Harijan, which, as you know, he edited. Quote My sympathies, says Gandhi, are all with the Jews. But my sympathy does not blind me. This is in 1938. So he's speaking about the Jews and the existential crisis of the Jews and so on. My sympathies are all with the Jews, but my sympathy does not blind me to the requirements of justice. The cry for the national home for the Jews does not make much appeal to me. The Palestine of the biblical conception is not a geographical tract. It is in their hearts. But if they must look to the Palestine of geography as their national home, it is wrong to enter it 
under the shadow of the British gun. A religious act cannot be performed with the aid of the bayonet or the bomb. They can settle in Palestine only by the goodwill of the Arabs. They should seek to convert the Arab heart. The same God rules the Arab heart, who rules the Jewish heart." Unquote. So that was Gandhi speaking way back in 1938, but with a clarity and a prescience that is very, very striking. I think it was, uh, not I think, I, you, you must have all heard this, uh, Clausewitz, the, the theoretician and the general on war, uh, way back in the 18th century, said that uh, war is a continuation of politics by other means. Because there are disputes about whether he said by other means or with other means. But let's assume for the moment that he said war is a continuation of politics by other means. It would seem that by extending that as a component of politics by other means to its extreme in the context of the state of Israel, it has flipped it into a situation where politics seems to be the continuation of war by other means, almost standing it on its head. And since the state of Israel came into being in very difficult and, uh, shall we say, disputed circumstances, and the history of the uprooting of Palestine, of what has variously been described as ethnic cleansing, as colonial settlement, a settler colonial policy, as combined with an orientalist harshness, racism, and so on and so forth, is, a, is what I think is culminated in, is perhaps one of the biggest kind of flashpoints in that whole saga, that holy, that sordid saga that we have been seeing over the last nearly a century, at least for 75 years now. Of course, there will be discussion on aspects of this as we go along today. Um, and uh, I want to say that uh, the, although we find, I, I think I'll, I'll stop by saying that we find there are two narratives now obtaining. One is what I, call, what I would call the state's narrative the, or the official narratives from Governments uh, where, surprisingly, uh, the cause of Israel is thought to be justified, particularly in the United States. And then there is, I think for the first time in a long time, a street narrative that is becoming very un uncomfortable to the state narrative, a street narrative that is also being reflected in increasing measure if not in the mainstream formal media, which particularly in the West seems to have predetermined uh, its viewpoint on this, but in the social media, in uh, alternate media, uh, and in the demonstrations and petitions uh, in social fora that we have seen across the world, uh, resulting in uh, polls of the kind that we've seen in the US where a majority of the population, and perhaps as many as 80% of Democrats particularly, find the war unpopular and think there should be a ceasefire. Um, whereas on the other hand, the official narrative is tending to get more and more regimented and ossified, where uh, Zionism is thought to be conflated with anti-Semitism where if you said from the river to the sea, it is seen as what you call exterminationist, as denying the state of Israel, its existence. So we are caught between these two narratives. I hope by the end of the day, we will have, we'll certainly be better informed about the issues at stake and uh, have a perspective to what is happening around us. Of course, I think all of us will be agreed that what is absolutely necessary is that the killing must stop, especially 
because of the heavy toll it takes on civilians and particularly children. Gaza has today been characterized as a graveyard of children. The war, in fact, is being characterized in some quarters as a war on children and so on. So with these uh, words, I'd like to invite, before that, to thank the curator of this, uh, of this colloquium, uh, my friend who also teaches at the Asian College of Journalism, uh, Stanley Johnny, who is the international affairs editor of The Hindu, uh, to, to speak to you, to set the context of our colloquium, and then we'll move on into the sessions proper. Thank you again. Thank you, <coughs> Sasha Kumar, sir, for the welcome remarks. And good morning, everybody. Mm, thanks to ACJ for organizing this event, uh, this colloquium on such a very important topic. Uh, we've been talking about it for the last three months, more than three months. Uh, so I'm sure that by the end of the day, we all will go home or to a hostel a lot wiser. Uh, you know, I, I would like to talk about three aspects of the ongoing conflict briefly, and then we will go into the specific session. Um, firstly, when we talk about this, you know, Israel's attack on the ongoing offensive in Gaza. Uh, so what he said, the state narrative. The Israeli narrative is that Hamas brought this, brought this upon themselves by carrying out the October 7 attack. So the three uh, points I want to talk about is to understand the historical context of the October 7 attack, to understand Israel's ongoing military operation in Gaza, and then its regional and other consequences. You know, when you try to understand the historical consequences, the historical context of the October 7 attack, so the Israelis would say that, or they are saying that, you know, this Hamas started this war by carrying out the attack. They would say that we left Gaza in 2005. Every soldier and every settler has been pulled back from Gaza in 2005. And there was a government in Gaza, which is the Hamas government, and even after the Israelis pulled back from Gaza, there was no peace. So this is the, 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 the state narrative. Um, but you need to factor in two more uh, you know, uh, points when you talk about this. One, even after, it's true that Israelis pulled back from Gaza in 2005, five years after the outbreak of the Second Intifada, but Gaza has never been free. Gaza was under uh, the blockade has been under the blockade since 2007. And then secondly, Gaza is not an independent, it is not an isolated entity, right? It's true that Gaza is run by Hamas, whereas West Bank, parts of the West Bank or the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank is run by Fatah. Gaza and Fatah may not like each other, but Palestinians see Gaza, West Bank and East Jerusalem as part of their future Palestinian state. So Gaza cannot remain as an island, you know. So even if Israel had withdrew from Gaza and put a blockade on Gaza, West Bank and East Jerusalem continue to remain under Israel's direct military occupation. And in 2020, in 2023, before the October 7 attack happened, some 240 people were killed in West Bank alone, of which over 200 were Palestinians. And there were occasional flare-ups in Jerusalem, which, you know, sometimes resulted in Israeli troops, you know, raiding the Al-Aqsa Mosque of Jerusalem. And uh, settler violence was, you know, a common thing, which, was, which is still going on against the Palestinian people in, in, in West Bank. And also, if you look at the West Bank, there were some 500, check, more than 500 checkpoints in the West Bank. Um, let's say some 700,000 settlers are living in West Bank and East Jerusalem. And Palestinians living in, even in Area C, which is supposedly under the control of the Palestinian Authority, they can't go from one place to the other. For example, if you want to travel from, I keep saying this example in my classes, if you want to travel from Ramallah to Abu Dhis, you'll have to go through several Israeli checkpoints. So that's the actual situation on the West Bank. 
So on the West Bank, the direct military occupation is continuing with violence, with settler violence, military violence, and also Palestinian violence. And then Gaza was under the blockade. This was the situation of the Palestinian territories. So Gaza cannot be seen in isolation. So that's one thing. And the secondly, if you look at the ongoing military offensive, Israeli ongoing military offensive in Gaza. So it's been, uh, you know, we were, we were planning to have this event on December 8th, as you may well know, but we couldn't have that because of the cyclone. It's been postponed to uh, today. And incidentally, I think this is also the 100th day of the offensive, right? And when Israel launched the war, I think Israel had set three objectives, two direct military objectives and one indirect objective. And two direct military objectives were, one, to dismantle Hamas, to crush Hamas, in the words of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and two, of course, to free hostages. Hamas had taken over 240 hostages. Over, I think, more than 100 hostages were freed through diplomacy, through negotiations. And then the third indirect objective is definitely to bolster Israel's deterrence. Right. So the deterrence point, it's a long shot because when it comes to West Asia, I think the deterrence theory is very weak, especially when you are talking about non-state actors. So let's keep that aside, or we will see how this is going to strengthen Israel's deterrence. My, my sense is that military, op this, this military operations Israel carried out has never strengthened Israel's deterrence, credible, has never helped Israel build credible deterrence against non-state actors in, in the region. That's one thing. But even if you look at the other two objectives, one, to dismantle Hamas, you know, Israeli politicians keep saying that they want to crush Hamas. Then they also compare Hamas to ISIS. Uh, the comparison is that ISIS uses terror as a means, you know, it is a terrorist organization. Hamas also uses terror as a means, which is, which is a sound argument. Hamas has killed a lot of innocent people, including civilians in, in Israel. So both are terrorist organizations, like ISIS was destroyed by regional countries in an, in, a, in, a, in an alliance supported by the Americans. Israel has the right to crush Hamas, this is the argument. But this is also a simpleton way of understanding what exactly is going on on the ground. Why? Because ISIS doesn't have a social cause. ISIS was an outgrowth of Al-Qaeda, which was superimposed on West Asian societies. It was imposed by itself. Whereas Hamas is part of the Palestinian society, and Hamas has a social cause. So as long as Israel continues the occupation of the Palestinian territories, and when it says that it wants to crush Hamas, I don't know how it is practically feasible. Okay, you may not like or you, you, may, you may like or may not like Hamas. You might disagree with Hamas's political ideology, which I do, as much as anybody else does. But the problem here is that, you know, on the one side, the, the occupation of the Palestinian territories continues. And on the other side, when you say you want to dismantle Hamas completely, it looks practically impossible. And also, I mean, you can see that in the last 100 years of war, Israel has killed over 24, close to 24,000 people. 90% of Gaza's population has been displaced. I think close to 60%, 60,000 people have been wounded. And then hospitals, even ambulances, schools, uh, you know, places of worship, everything came under attack. And more than a million people from northern Gaza has been pushed to the south. And now south is being bombarded, especially Khan Yunus and other places in the south. So this is what the UN called a graveyard. Gaza is a graveyard for children and a living hell for everybody else. This is the reality that's happening in Gaza. So if Israel's military objective is to kill as many people, Palestinians, as possible, or displace them or wound them, I think they are clearly meeting their objectives. But if their objective is to dismantle Hamas, I don't know how this is going to, this is achievable. And secondly, the objective of freeing hostages, even after 100 years, 100 days of operation, only one hostage has been released by Israel's military operation, right? One baby. And uh, uh, more than 100 people who were released were released through talks, through diplomacy. And three of the hostages were killed by Israelis themselves. So this is the ground reality in Gaza, but the war is likely to continue. And then thirdly, the last point is that if you talk about the geopolitical fallout, I think we will have a detailed session coming up with Professor Kumar Swami, um, um, you know, and Marshal Matisharan and Ambassador Rakesh Sood. Uh, but then if you, if you look at, briefly, if you look at the geopolitical fallout, one interesting uh, 
point of view is that one interesting aspect is that the United States continuing unconditional support for Israel's military operation, which is creating other issues in the region, both for the United States and other members in the country, in, in the region, right? I'm not surprised by Biden administration's policy, but it's interesting to see the contrast between the, you know, between the US, the Washington's policy towards different conflicts. Two of the major conflicts that are dominating the headlines are on the one side you have Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and on the other side you have Israel's attack on Gaza. So with regard to Russia, the United States has mobilized Western public opinion, imposed sanctions on Russia, supplying weapons worth, you know, uh, billions of dollars to Ukraine to fight the Russians in Ukraine. And on the other side, it's been 100 days of Israeli bombardment of Gaza and the Biden administration still hasn't called for a ceasefire. Not even a call for a ceasefire. So this will definitely have its own you know, repercussions in the region. We will have to wait and see what kind of repercussions. But at the same time, you can see the war is widening. Because when the war broke out, I think many thought that Hezbollah, it would be Hezbollah that would expand the war. Or either Hezbollah would attack Israel or Israel would carry out a preemptive strike on Hezbollah, widening the conflict. That didn't happen. But instead it was Houthis who expanded the war, drawing the United States deeper into the conflict. Now the United States is attacking Yemen. The United States on the one side continues to back Israel, support its offensive in Gaza, and on the other side it is trying to tackle you know, the, the regional repercussions of the war by carrying out airstrikes in Yemen. So that's what we are witnessing. And then secondly, uh, you know, what will happen, you know, how this is going to affect Israel-Palestine relationship in, 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 in particular. Uh, so many people were arguing that after October 7, the two-state solution is dead, as if the two-state solution was alive before October 7. So the two-state solution had, I mean, if you ask me, it died long time ago. But October 7, it was buried. Basically, so the future is bleak. We will have to, I think, uh, talk about what kind of a sol what kind of a feasible solution is there. But if I caught John Mayer, unfortunately, he was supposed to join us uh, uh, in this panel, uh, but today he couldn't. But as John Mayer once said, the only practical solution to Israel-Palestine conflict is a two-state solution. But that ship has sailed long time ago. So that's it. Thank you very much. Now we will go into the specific panel discussions. Um, hi. So I don't have any other remarks to make. We will straight away start uh, the panel. So I'll invite Ambassador Agar Sooth to uh, make his comments. So we will have, uh, let's say, 15 to 20 minutes roughly for each speaker, and then we will open it up for question and answer. I mean, whatever. Okay. Maybe that is better. No. Okay. Thank you. Let me first of all thank uh, the Asian College of Journalism. It's very impressive that despite it being a Sunday and despite it being Pongal, we have such a full house. So clearly, something to do with the uh, attraction that all of you have for this subject or for Stanley's pulling power. So what I'm going to talk about, or the panel subject, is the geopolitical implications of this conflict. You would tend to think that Israel, a small country, Hamas, non-state actor, I mean, why should there be geopolitical implications? But I think it is because, A, the geography of the region in which this conflict is taking place, and B, the involvement of major powers. Now, Stanley kind of hinted at it. If you want to look at the proximate cause of this war, then you would say that it is 7th of October, 2023. You have the Hamas strike, you know, 1,200, over 1,200 Israelis are killed, 240 taken hostage. 
this has never happened. This kind, this scale of casualty has never happened for Israel since the Holocaust. So it shocked the Israelis from their whatever sense of security that they had built up since the Holocaust. But if you want to start looking back, and unfortunately, when you have these long-standing conflicts, there is a tendency to look back into history. And uh, when you look at root causes, it becomes extremely difficult to see where they lie. The U.S. has been a very important player, particularly after the Cold War ended. So beginning 1991, the efforts made by the U.S. to bring about a lasting peace in the region through the Oslo I and Oslo II Accords, which actually were sanctified by the UN Security Council, which formally accepted the idea of a two-state solution. But then the two-state solution was steadily undermined by the right-wing governments in Israel for the last 25 years. And the U.S. and the international community did very little to stop that. They just stood by and saw that happen, kind of hoping that whatever was going on, the policy that Israel had adopted, a kind of a graduated policy, was something that would bring about some kind of lasting peace. Obviously not. You look back beyond into history, beyond uh, the 1990s, and you would say even the UN partition plan of 1947-48, which was actually a step forward from the 1917 Balfour Declaration, which Britain had made at that time, promising a homeland to the Jews, but then it had a mandate, a mandate for Palestine, for the Palestinian territory, because, you know, with the end of World War I, you had the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. And this whole area was part of the Ottoman Empire, and under a deal between Britain and France, which is uh, the two diplomats who were involved, so it is known as the Sykes-Picot Pact, it was decided that Syria and Lebanon would go under the French sphere of influence and Palestine, Iraq, and then later on, uh, Palestine, Iraq, Transjordani, as it was called, which is now Jordan and all this West Bank, Israel, and so on. And then subsequently, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf sheikdoms. These all became part of the British influence or British zone of influence. Now the Palestinian, since Britain had the mandate for Palestine, after the Holocaust in Germany against the Jews, came the decision by the newly set up United Nations to use the British mandate to divide, to partition the country. And immediately that Israel was established, the first war between Israel and the Arab countries, Egypt, Syria, etc., broke out in 1947-48. Another one, 67, yet another one in 1973. But since 1973, no Arab country has been able to attack Israel. Israel has ensured its security to that extent. So now the Israeli threat is one non-state actor called Hamas, another non-state actor called Hezbollah, and uh, you know also aligned with Hamas is the Islamic Jihad, which is also operating in the region. 
So in 1967, Israel occupied Gaza, and as Stanley reminded us, it vacated Gaza in 2005. And since then, it has been more or less under Hamas rule. However, the question is that since 7th of October, I mean, we can keep looking back at these root causes and we can keep trying to find but somewhere, if we want to look forward, we'll have to make a beginning at some point. Because what these root causes show us is that there is plenty of blame to go around for everybody. Whether Britain, which was responsible in the first place for the partition, the Americans who have been the major power, um, right-wing Israeli governments, and the most right-wing one is currently the one which has some of the most uh, ultra-Orthodox ultra Jewish groups, plus the most extreme right-wing parties, some of which do not accept even the right of the Palestinians to stay on that territory. And so they have gone to the extent of looking at them as not deserving to be on that territory. The question is, is Israel making the same mistakes? I mean, if you think about it, the U.S. had its moment with 9-11 and then launched its global war on terror. Uh, what has happened since the global war on terror? We see Afghanistan back under the Taliban, Iraq in disarray, Libya in disarray, US undergoing its own domestic changes that have partly been brought out by this, uh, you know, its interventions in this area, Iran closer to its nuclear ambitions than before. The introduction of jihad and then first Al-Qaeda and then the Islamic State. And I don't know if the global war on terror was supposed to do all this. But somewhere the problem became that you couldn't define what victory was in the global war on terror. And because you couldn't define what victory was, you didn't know where to end or how to process or how, how to strategize because you couldn't define the end objective. Now, for Israel, a return to pre-October 7 is impossible. That just cannot happen. Because the, the objectives that it has set itself, namely dismantling Hamas or uh, rescuing the hostages, and uh, restoring a degree of deterrence is based on its earlier policies. What, were Israel's, what was Israel's security doctrine? Israel's security doctrine had been based on four factors. First, deterrence. Second, an early warning system. Third, defense capability. And fourth, a decisive victory. So let's take them one by one. On 7th of October, it became clear that Hamas was not deterred. Obviously. Now, the fact that Hamas was not deterred is also clear because even after leaving, even after quitting Gaza in 2005, there were at least four different occasions when Israel undertook limited military campaigns in Gaza. 22 days campaign in 2008, an eight-day campaign in 2012, a 50-day campaign in 2014, an 11-day campaign in 2021, and the current war, which is now on its 100th day. You know, this tactic of Israel, the Israelis themselves call it, it is called mowing the grass. 
what it meant was that you keep you realize behind this tactic of mowing the grass is a realization that we cannot have um a comprehensive solution or a perfect solution and so therefore the only thing to do is to keep the problem within manageable proportions so you sort of keep mowing the grass you know each time there is a little bit of a threat you go back you restore the terrains you mow the grass you achieve a peace and the level of violence that erupts after maybe 4 years 5 years 8 years 10 years is something that you can manage but it is a constant state of mowing the grass and that is what means by the securitization of the state which um, other sociologists have talked about has happened in israel so clearly this wasn't as 7th october showed us this didn't work the hamas saw its timing the the timing of the abraham accords they felt that the whole palestinian cause was being uh, forgotten they also saw israel's internal crisis because the current government of uh, prime minister netanyahu is by far the most unpopular government you know since taking over it has prime minister netanyahu has been trying since january of this year to january of 2023 to uh, undertake comprehensive judicial reforms uh, which would satisfy his extreme right wing coalition partners and we can talk in the q and a if you like about the kind of judicial reform because israel doesn't have a written constitution so the supreme court has what they call a basic structure doctrine and therefore every law has to be cleared by the supreme court which according to netanyahu gives the supreme court inordinate amount of power and and obviously this is something that uh, his extreme right wing coalition partners want changed so bb has been doing exactly the same thing he has been delaying judicial appointments the supreme court has had three retirements no new appointments have been made etc etc familiar stuff so uh, he is but what it has led to is every weekend there have been protests in the cities and towns in israel ordinary people it has also led to divisions within the society and i think the hamas saw this and uh, wanted to take advantage of this now the second element of their security doctrine is early warning early warning there was evidence of the build up there was evidence of exercises but because of internal differences the assessment that was made was a flawed assessment the israeli assessment was that because the hamas was being funded with israeli agreement obviously by qatar and so on that a degree of corruption and a degree of satisfaction had set in into the hamas administration israel was allowing 20000 workers from gaza to come and work on a daily basis in israel so there was that engagement and you know those wages and all of that so they felt that this was something that would keep the situation stable ultimately their assessment was a victim of the confirmation bias they didn't think that the attack would come in the manner in which it did they thought the tunnels well the tunnels they had taken care of and uh, then came the defense part so in the defense part the israeli iron dome all of that it was effective but then the hamas took a very strange kind of a thing they used drones to neutralize the border cameras that the israelis had and they used bulldozers to attack on the ground they just broke down those barriers those concrete barriers and that was not something that the israelis had thought about and so in that sense 
the Hamas broke down their defense structure. And the final thing of the Israeli security structure is a decisive victory. But then here you will we come to the same problem. What after that victory? I mean, who do you put in? Because Israel doesn't want the Palestine Authority to go in. They had deliberately kept two separate centers of power. The Palestine Authority in, uh, in the West Bank and Ramallah and uh, Hamas in Gaza. Now, if you look at the major powers, you've got the U.S., as I said. The U.S. relations with Israel are probably undergoing their most severe test, as it were. The U.S. is holding Israel in a tight embrace. We saw Biden going there. We've seen Blinken go there uh, at least more than half a dozen times to the region. But the tight embrace is also intended to constrain. You know, when the embrace is too tight, then you... Now, obviously, for uh, Netanyahu, this is a tricky kind of a situation. He wants the embrace, but he doesn't want to be constrained. The Netanyahu also would like reconstruction for the region to come from the Gulf Arab states. But for that, he has to do a lot of repairing the relationship. The EU, but the EU is also divided on this because the EU is also scared of the refugee outflow. And then, of course, you have the Russians and the Chinese. The Chinese like the idea of the U.S. being distracted. But at the same time, are not comfortable with the economic fallout of the continuing or expanding conflict. And the conflict has been expanded. Of that, there is no doubt. It, and we, we've already talked about it. We saw that the Israelis took out the Hamas leader in Beirut. This was followed by the suicide attacks in Iran where 95 people at Qasim Soleimani's mosque, his uh, mazar, were killed. We've seen the heightened strikes by the Houthis in the Red Sea. And there have been about 50 targets in Yemen that have been um, affected by the British, the Americans, and the Western naval fleets. Ultimately, There is a difference between justice and vengeance. And that difference is law. But law applied uniformly. And if it is not applied uniformly, then it becomes more force, then becomes oppression, and it becomes vengeance. And I think that is what we are seeing. So the challenge is, can Netanyahu do all this in terms of Finding space for maneuver, can the Americans manage this? I mean, if you talk to most Israelis, they would say that Netanyahu has to go now. That creates political difficulties. In the middle of this conflict, what happens? And that is what makes it so uncertain and its implications or geopolitical implications uh, so much a matter of chance where major powers are really left struggling. To top it all, you've got the election season coming in, uh, beginning with Iowa in uh, January itself. I think on the 15th or something like that, you have the first primary in the United States. So this is where the geopolitics of the region, uh, in, geopolitical implications of the conflict in the region are today at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your insightful comments. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions in the Q&A session. Shall I now invite Professor Kumar Swami? Thank you. Um, um, thanks uh, for the organizers for having me here. A couple of personal notes. This is my first formal engagement with Hindu after 30 years. I was a stringer for the newspaper from Jerusalem just before the Oslo agreement was signed. In JNU, if you're familiar with, it is not about left or right. 
it is not about right or wrong. It trains you to be the wind. So what I'm going to say may not be the popular opinion on the conventional one, but Jane, you trains you to be a free person. Most of us try to be a weathercock. That's a different story. The title, Palestine is clear, occupation is clear, endless. Yes, which means there is no end. But where do you begin? You can begin in 1967. Since this audience is well informed, I'm not going to bore you with details telegraphically. You can begin in 1948. You can begin in 1917. You can begin in 1881. Or you can begin in 637. When Jerusalem became Islamic. If you are familiar with the region, the Aram al-Sharif, the third holiest place of Islam, is on top of a pre-Islamic, non-Islamic, un-Islamic structure. So therefore, where you begin will tell you what you are looking for. I'll leave it to you. The most interesting thing about the entire conflict is the Palestine question is back in the center. If you look at in the last 30 years, every time people thought Palestinian question is on the margins, something happened somewhere, the question is back in the center fold. And we thought that the, the Abraham Accord simply marginalized the Palestinian cause, and the Arab countries are willing to differentiate between the support for the Palestinians and their bilateral relations. Saudi Arabia is almost closer to normalizing relations weeks before the conflict. So Hamas has put us back saying that the stability of the Middle East, I'm more comfortable with Middle East than West Asia because West Asia is rather narrow. Middle East is what the countries of the region describe themselves. It's my, I don't want to impose my description on them. The countries call themselves Middle East, so I use the word Middle East. So the countries in the Middle East you can no longer have a stability without resolving the Palestinian question. But that also takes us a question. While Hamas put the issue on the table, is Hamas the troubleshooter? I think that is where the challenge will come. Well, nobody can deny the Palestinian issue and the centrality of Hamas in leading the cause is Hamas the problem solver. We all know, studying our national history, the resistance and nation building are two different phases. We know that freedom struggle needed Gandhi. The India's rebuilding needed Nehru. Imagine yourself, the converse is the case. You will have a disaster on your hand, on both fronts. Then what kind of solution we are looking for? I would say three, two, one. Today, what you have is a relatively autonomous Gaza Strip under the Hamas control, the West Bank under the Palestinian Authority, and Israel. This is what the reality is. Abbas became president in December 2004, after Yasser Arafat's passing. From 2004 until now, he has visited India six times. That's the president. He could not set foot in the Gaza Strip even once. Not because he did not want to go. He could not. So when you're talking about the Palestinians, there is a de facto separation exists today on the ground. I can't think of any national liberation movements which has two sets of garments. I often ask myself, if Israel cannot unite the Palestinians, what will unite them? So therefore, the three-state solution is a reality today. But that is not the solution. There is no way you can have that. The second option is one-state solution, which is very popular in this part of the world. For me, the one-state solution is like having Oh, let's forget about Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan. Let's have a one great India. He's as good as that. If you look at history, seriously speaking, 
When was the last time a believer and a non-believer were equal? Go back to any time. I'm talking theory. I'm not talking practice. Because when you are in Jaini, you know the difference between theory and practice. Stanley will tell us more seriously, we only have BMW socialists on the campus. So therefore, I'm not getting into the practical part of it. I'm talking theoretical. When is the equality comes? It doesn't. So the realistic solution is two-state solution. It's difficult. Yes. There are so many problems. Yes. People have been trying and failing. Yes. As long as Netanyahu is in the picture, there is no way you can realize. Agree all of them. I only take you to 622. If you remember, when Prophet started preaching a faith, he was stoned. That is why he went from Mecca to Medina. So resistance and opposition is integral. You don't fold your shop just because somebody is opposing. So however difficult it is, however challenging it is, the only viable option to the solution to the problem is a two-state solution. There is no other way out. And if you look at all of you, you will face enormous difficulties in your life. Just because the problem is that you fold your dream, you don't. You chase your dream. No matter how difficult it is, the same applies to here. No matter how difficult it is, two-state solution is a only viable, realistic option for these guys. No other way. Israel cannot exist without the Palestinians. Palestinians cannot exist without the Israelis. Sooner they recognize, the easier it will be. Who can take us there? You can criticize the United States, vilify them, demonstrate against them, condemn against them, carry a rally against them, editorialize them. Who can do a better job? India? China? Russia? European Union? Saudi Arabia? Qatar? Jordan? Or even Iran? Who can be the troubleshooter? No matter how difficult it is, how biased the United States is, today we don't have anyone other than the United States to do the heavy lifting. Others can contribute to that, influence the United States. If you think that X, Y, Z can do individually or collectively, tell the United States, back off, I will solve it. Find one person. That is a reality. So, if you want to change the world, first of all, you should have a reality as it is, without the blinkers. Accept as it is. Then only you can change it. Today, we don't have it. But what this crisis has given us, you know, I'm going to draw a parallel between two events. One is the 9-11, the other is 1973. Both from a different angle. 9-11, we know that Israel was thinking it's a 9-11 moment, that's for all everything. For me, it is also a 9-11 moment for the Ummah. If you look at a, a vast majority of Islamophobia in the West, was directly linked to 9-11. And today, you have the same situation, even though people are not saying it openly. Tell me which Quran says killing a woman is acceptable. Enlighten me. Kidnapping a woman, kidnapping a children, kidnapping an elderly, tell me which Quran verses says, yes, it is acceptable, it is a cause. I don't think so. But today, majority are not ready to speak out because they think criticizing Hamas means criticizing the Palestinians, criticizing the Arabs, then criticizing the Hamas. So therefore, they are not ready. Sooner or later, you will have to come to face this. Similarly, 73. If you look at 73, the Arabs remember the beginning of the war, the Israelis also beginning of the war. Because Arabs thought we won, we surprised Israel. The Israelis thought, why were we surprised? So if you look at the discourse even today, the Arabs talk about the 6th of October, the Israelis also talk about 6th of October. They don't talk about how the war ended on 22nd, because that's the bad news. The capture of more territories did not satisfy Israeli. And similarly, the having the third army under Israeli control was not a pleasant thing for Egyptians to remember. So therefore, both of them, even today, talk about the beginning of the war. The same situation even today. 
The Palestinians will talk about the 7th October. The Israelis will also talk about 7th October. But now there is a, a ray of hope. The 73 war brought about a realization in Israel saying that war alone is not an option. Once the dust settles down, the same thing will come even today. Once a ceasefire comes, once everything falls in place, you need to recognize continuing the military option is not the long-term settlement to the problem. So the same thing, 73 led to the Camp David Agreement. I am putting my neck and say, once the dust settles down, the Israelis and the Palestinians will have to come to terms, yes, I don't like, I want more, but I can't ignore you all being my neighbor. That is the only way out. It will not be happening tomorrow. That's the long term. But since it's uh, journalism, let me put one more point. We need to have a greater honesty in looking at things. The Israelis will have to ask honestly, yes, we want to capture the hostages back. Didn't happen. Since the starting of the land offensive, more Israeli soldiers were killed than the number of hostages in Gaza Strip. So Israel will have to ask a question, is it a cost-benefit analysis? What was it? Is it a sensible policy? Similarly, Hamas and its supporters will have to ask a question. Yes, you surprised Israel. You carried out a military operation. You killed so many people. 24,000 Palestinian life. Sooner or later, you need to ask that question. Accountability is applicable to everyone, no exceptions. It may not happen officially, but we may also have to take sooner or later. The second thing would be, I would say that uh, there is a reference to river and the sea. When you say river and the sea, which means no Israel. And uh, will that constitute genocide? Is it a call for genocide? That's become very important now that South Africa is raising that flag. But when you say that, I want to destroy your state, how does the other person who are on the receiving end will feel? The final point is, you know, Palestinian rights are important. There is no two opinion on that. It's non-negotiable. But there are also rights of women. I think, you know, sooner or later, we need to ask a question. Is the Palestinian rights more important than rights of the Jewish women? You can say that they are more important. Absolutely, I have no problems with that. My only request will be, then don't celebrate 8th of March. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for your provo provocative comments. Took me back to the JNU days when I used to sit in your lectures. I wanted to interfere and ask you questions. I, I'll, I'll keep it for the Q&A session. Uh, now, let me invite uh, Air Marshal Matishwaran for his comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stanley. Let me first uh, thank Asian College of Journalism and uh, Mr. Sashikumar uh, for this excellent uh, event that's been organized and allowing me an opportunity to talk today. Uh, let me look at the uh, uh, military or the operational and the war-related issues in what's happening in uh, um, uh, Gaza. But before that, a certain uh, orientation is necessary. In my f second visit to Israel, and that was in 1997, uh, I was in Haifa. They put up, it a, it's a lovely city. There's a hill uh, range there. On top of that is the Dan Hotel. And from the room, it, the view was beautiful because the Haifa Bay was, uh, you know, beautifully visible. And in it was parked USS Eisenhower. Uh, they had just come for their rest and recuperation as R&R, &R, as they call it. 5,000 officers and sailors were in Haifa for the next four days. The Israelis laid out the red carpet. They were 
you know, uh, welcomed everywhere, and they had obviously whatever Western recuperation that they had. The coupling of Israel and U.S., particularly from the military perspective, is extremely powerful and strong. And that's something we need to understand. Second, in geopolitics, geopolitical interests are governed by ruthless economic interests, and in it lies exploitation and extraction for the great powers. Israel is a geopolitical outpost of the great powers. The villains are the US and the UK. So you go back and study the history, that must sink in very well. The political leaders use religion, evangelism, and radical right as convenient to ensure people are kept prisoners to their requirements and the final objectives are sustained. So if you go back into history and analyze, the Balfour Declaration was deeply flawed, but, and what uh, Mr. Sasikma quoted from Gandhi is absolutely, you know, prescient when you now analyze that. The using Bible or biblical stories to actually argue that Jews have to come and settle down there doesn't have any kind of a human rights argument in that process. You can't evict somebody from a land which they populated for 2,000 years and then bring in somebody else to say this is their God-given homeland and you can put them there. That's settler colonialism. So Israel is a settler colonial state. We must understand that logic very clearly. Second, it's a, as I said, it's a geopolitical outpost for American interests in which the two world wars were wars of empires and the existing empires were demolished and weakened. The U.S. emerged as the strongest power and its interests had to be served. And that being the center of gravity of global energy resources, fossil fuel resources, it had to have its outpost to control the region. And therefore, the instability in the Middle East, therefore, Israel does what it does. The second part is, if you look at Israeli military, and many of my visits, I've asked that question, you have so much of it. Israel is seen as the country that ranks first in innovation and disruption and engineers the education and research in a phenomenal way. But does much of that go into its military hardware? Hardly. $3.5 billion of military support comes from the U.S. every year. Over the last 20-year period, they've had something like $300 billion worth of assistance from the U.S. That continues to flow. An average Israeli, when you talk to him, he'll say, if the big brother is giving it to me, then why should I buy from elsewhere? It's coming free. Let me use that. So much of the Israeli military, whether it's Air Force, whether it's F-35 that's coming in now, they have about 35 uh, 40 aircraft, which is the state-of-the-art latest fifth-generation fighter aircraft that's hammering away on, on the Gaza, or the F-16s that are upgraded to Block 52 Plus, or the F-15s that are there, or other weapons, even the weapons that they developed, uh, like the air defense weapons, like the Iron Dome, etc., with their own research, has a tremendous amount of contribution from American companies. So. It is also serves as the low-cost research development centers for much of Americans' military industrial complex. And that we need to understand as well. The second part to understand is the concept of war fighting. The Western, particularly the American concept of war fighting, is to use enormous firepower to demolish the adversary and they don't make any difference between the military targets and civilian targets. In fact, I would say, if you go through history and analyze each and every war in the 20th century, the civilian casualties have been enormous, starting off from Korea down to now the latest one. And that's deliberate. The U.S. will say it's collateral damage. No. If you look at the civilizational or the cultural aspect of war fighting in the West, killing civilians. We go into the uh, Second World War, the, uh, the ruin of Dresden or the bombing of 
Tokyo, I mean, bombing of, uh, five, five bombing of Tokyo, or the atomic bombs in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, they've all been deliberate decisions to ensure maximum people are killed and to create the kind of terror in the population. That's the essence of war fighting strategy. John Pilger, a very well-known, you know, journalist and a documentary filmmaker died on December 30th. In one of his fine movies where he exposes the lies on the 2003 Iraqi war or the 1991 Iraq war and the sanctions, asked Madeleine Albright, five, half a million Iraqi children died because of sanctions. Was that worth it? And she says, I think it was well worth it. And that's the kind of answer you get. Well, so the core ideology in terms of cultural context in which war fighting takes place from these forces must be understood. Civilian killing does not matter to them. Political statements may be different. In fact, it is purposely done to increase the maximum civilian casualties to create the kind of terror. Israel has imbibed the same culture. IDF, we have a lot of regards from the uh, Indian military simply because when we study the 1948 war, which they fought against all the Arab armies, to declare independence subsequently, 47, 48, or the 1956 Moshe Dayan's, you know, uh, literally a blitzkrieg, or the 1967 a preemptive strike that immobilized all the Arab, you know, militaries completely. These are all, from a military perspective, very interesting studies that we do. 1973 war is equally important. But after 1973, Israel has not fought a national army really speaking. They've been now engaged in Lebanon, which they occupied for nearly two decades. They've been fighting Hezbollah, they're fighting now Hamas, they've been attacking Syria, they've been attacking, uh, you know, Iraq. So they have gone into a different, you know, kind of conflict prosecution for their interest in a different way. What does that do to a military? When I visited the, the National War Museum in Cairo just two months ago in November, and as what Dr. Kumaraswamy indicated, all the displays there indicate that Arab-Israeli War of 1973 was an Arab victory. But there is an interesting perspective that, that's important for us to notice. Why, is it, why do they say it's Arab victory? Is that they were humiliated phenomenally in 1967 and they needed to avenge that humiliation, and therefore it worked. And therefore, the start of the war was a massive humiliation for Israel. The Barlev line was demolished. The Egyptians fought extremely well, so did the Assyrians. And this process seems to have redeemed some of their prestige and honor. And then they decided, okay, fine, we need to now call the you know, conflict quits and then ensure peace for the rest of the time. They also understood that Israel is not strong on its own. Without the American support, be it 1947-48 or in 1956 or in 1967 or in 1973 or now, without American support, the IDF will have a serious crisis and serious problem. And that they've understood, the Egyptians understood. So Sadat, went along with it, created that peace treaty, so did the Jordans, and the Syrians went away in a certain fashion. And the state-to-state -state war, which Israeli defense forces have been known well for their professionalism, has gone away into the background. So what does that do to the military? When a military is professional, it fights extremely well, and every military is motivated or even an insurgent group when it's motivated for its survival and motivated for the, to address the injustice done to it, it's highly motivated, fights extremely well and ruthlessly. But when a military gets indoctrinated by religious radicalism, that's the downfall of a military or even for an insurgent organization. And this is what we need to understand. IDF, I believe the political right that has emerged much more strongly in the last 20, 25 years in Israel, has done more damage to the IDF. And therefore, Benjamin Lambert, when he analyzes the 2006 war with Hezbollah, he says Israel has not come off well. The air chief was sacked by the Israeli government. 
after the Neptune 2006 war. Similarly, today in Hamas, against Hamas, they can claim that they are going to eradicate completely. It's almost an impossible task, which the Americans have said. They also warned Israel, don't get into a war with Hezbollah. You will not win. You may end up losing. And as the escalation happens, now the Houthis have come in, into the picture. And as Iran now encourages more and more activities from Hezbollah, Israel may have a problem. So what are the number of casualties that have happened in Gaza? About 6,700 casualties as per a reasonably accurate official estimate. 6,700 means about 2,000 killed. Normally, one is to six is what you would, you know, see the ratio of killed to injured. But here, in an urban warfare, it is uh, one is to three is probably what would be the right estimate. If 2,000 IDF soldiers have died, this is not a simple, easy cakewalk for them. It's a very tough battle. The Gaza has about 300 kilometers of underground tunneling system, and they worked over it for two decades, really building various resources. Now, of course, Israel says they've demolished much of it, but the point is any insurgency or any resistance movement, I don't call them as terrorists because it's, uh, it is a resistance movement against oppression, any resistance movement cannot be eliminated if its external sanctuaries are not eliminated. And there are enough external sanctuaries. The LTT in Sri Lanka was eliminated because external sanctuaries were eliminated. Right? So Hamas will survive. The second point is, I mentioned about the religious uh, ideology. While Hamas is a religious group, its operational group, the Al-Khazar brigades, are pure professional militaries. And we must also remember, Hamas is a smaller group which looks, wants to use the religion to get all the people in the Islamic world to support them. Much of, many of the Palestinians and the Fatah included are more secular. And they do not look at a religion to be used, unlike the Israeli right, which is entirely, you know, they're using the Bible and the religious radicalism to actually motivate their people. These effects will be short-lived. But war fighting capabilities, therefore Al-Qasar brigades are fighting extremely well. They, they are just 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 people. Israel has mobilized a standing professional army is about 170,000. They mobilized 300,000 reservists who were arraigned against Gaza. But the last week they withdrawn four brigades from Gaza itself. That tells you something else. And obviously the problems are emerging elsewhere. Israel has a compulsory military service. After 10th and 12th, or after 12th, the boys serve for three years mandatory military service, girls serve for two years mandatory military service. But they also form the numbers in these numbers that I've given. They cannot be used for war fighting. A reservist has to be trained. A reservist for active reserve of 20 years in Israel, he serves every year one month in military service and keeps himself, uh, his skills honed and then comes into fighting when it's required. But all that is declining simply because the political leadership uses the military, indoctrinates it on religious lines, and uses it to actually deal with Palestinians more than with other state national militaries, if they are threats. And that is a problem, because your mindset gets changed, your professionalism gets affected,